Universitas Binawan berdiri sejak tahun 2001 Saat ini kami berkembang dengan 13 program studi yang tersebar ke dalam 6 fakultas Pertama, Fakultas Keperawatan dan Kebidanan dengan 3 program studi Yaitu D3 Kebidanan, S1 Keperawatan, dan Profesi Nurse Yang kedua, kami memiliki Fakultas Kesehatan Masyarakat dengan 3 prodi juga yaitu D4 Keselamatan dan Kesehatan Kerja, kemudian S1 Gizi, dan S1 Teknik Lingkungan. Yang ketiga adalah Fakultas Sains dan Teknologi dengan tiga program studi, yaitu D4 Teknologi Laboratorium Medis, S1 Farmasi, dan S1 Aktuaria. Yang keempat, kami memiliki Fakultas Fisioterapi dengan program studi D4 Fisioterapi. Dan kelima, Fakultas Sosial dan Humaniora dengan program studi S1 Kesejahteraan Sosial dan program studi S1 Psikologi. Terakhir, kami memiliki Fakultas Ekonomi dan Bisnis dengan program studi S1 Manajemen. Metode pembelajaran di Universitas Binawan dengan menggunakan metode perkuliahan dalam jaringan dan belajar langsung melalui praktikum serta magang di institusi nasional dan internasional. Nah, dengan metode ini terbukti bahwa sudah banyak alumni Universitas Binawan yang terserap di pasar kerja internasional. 
So, mengapa harus kuliah di Universitas Binawan? Karena kami tidak hanya mendasari konsep pengetahuan, namun juga memberikan pengalaman langsung untuk menguatkan kompetensi yang diperlukan pasar kerja. Ayo wujudkan mimpi kalian bersama Universitas Binawan, kampus internasional, digital, dan berakhlak. Binawan, kampusku. Kami berdua lulusan dari Universitas Binawan Jakarta Kami berdua lulusan tahun 2018 dan sekarang bekerja di Iron Food Industrial Catering Jadi nggak akan nyesel untuk kuliah di Binawan Jakarta Dan 
berprestasi Misi seimbang Wujudkan insan sehat yang mandiri Pangan dan hidup bersih Menuju bangsa yang sehat Hey, Berprestasi Masyarakat sehat, cerdas, mandiri, produktif Serta bangsa sehat Berprestasi Karena gizi seimbang Pedoman gizi seimbang Untukku Untuk kesehatanku Gizi seimbang Bangsa sehat Dan berprestasi Setiap pagi Ayo sarapan Agar tubuh sehat Dengan gizi seimbang Ayo semua Wujudkan harapan Gizi seimbang Bangsa sehat berprestasi Selamat datang di Universitas Binawan Universitas Binawan berdiri sejak tahun 2001 Saat ini kami berkembang dengan 13 program studi yang tersebar ke dalam 6 fakultas Pertama, Fakultas Keperawatan dan Kebidanan dengan 3 program studi Yaitu D3 Kebidanan, S1 Keperawatan, dan Profesi Nurse Yang kedua, kami memiliki Fakultas Kesehatan Masyarakat dengan 3 prodi juga Yaitu D4 Keselamatan dan Kesehatan Kerja kemudian S1 Gizi, dan S1 Teknik Lingkungan. Yang ketiga adalah Fakultas Sains dan Teknologi dengan tiga program studi, yaitu D4 Teknologi Laboratorium Medis, S1 Farmasi, dan S1 Aktuaria. Yang keempat, kami memiliki Fakultas Fisioterapi dengan program studi D4 Fisioterapi. Dan kelima, Fakultas Sosial dan Humaniora, dengan program studi S1 Kesejahteraan Sosial dan program studi S1 Psikologi. Terakhir, kami memiliki Fakultas Ekonomi dan Bisnis dengan program studi S1 Manajemen. Metode pembelajaran di Universitas Binawan dengan menggunakan metode perkuliahan dalam jaringan dan belajar langsung melalui praktikum serta magang di institusi nasional dan internasional. Nah, dengan metode ini, Terbukti bahwa sudah banyak alumni Universitas Binawan yang terserap di pasar kerja internasional. So, mengapa harus kuliah di Universitas Binawan? Karena kami tidak hanya mendasari konsep pengetahuan, namun juga memberikan pengalaman langsung untuk menguatkan kompetensi yang diperlukan pasar kerja. Ayo wujudkan mimpi kalian bersama Universitas Binawan, kampus internasional, digital, dan berakhlak. Binawan Kampusku
perkenalkan nama saya Indra Prianto Nama saya Yuliana Sitorus Kami berdua lulusan dari Universitas Binawan Jakarta Kami berdua lulusan tahun 2018 dan sekarang bekerja di Aerofood Industrial Catering Jadi nggak akan nyesel untuk kuliah di Binawan Jakarta Semua kita bangun pagi-pagi Minum air putih Delapan gelas sehari Pakai sepatumu Mari olahraga Lari bersepeda atau lainnya Atur makananmu Untuk sehari-hari Batasi minyak garam gula Jangan berlebihan Dan jangan lupa timbang Berat badanmu Ayo kawan semua kita terapkan Gizi seimbang, gizi seimbang Badan sehat pikiran cerdas perilaku mandiri Gizi seimbang, gizi seimbang Produktif kreatif serta bangsa sehat berprestasi Makananmu untuk sehari-hari Batasi minyak garam gula Jangan berlebihan dan jangan lupa timbang Berat badanmu Ayo kawan semua kita terapkan Gizi seimbang, gizi seimbang Badan sehat pikiran cerdas perilaku mandiri Gizi seimbang, gizi seimbang Produktif, kreatif, serta bangsa sehat Berprestasi
Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good morning everyone and welcome back again to the online webinar series Lens Learn from Experience Sharing Session among Asian Nutrition Experts. I'm Lina. I'm delighted to be your moderator for your first session in today's event. Of course, this event is presented by the Department of Nutrition, Binawan University. And on behalf of the organizing committee, I'd say thank you and welcome to the webinar series, LENS. I'm so glad to meet you again. I'm so happy as well, because I will be with Ibu Hana Nabila Enfield as my partner on leading today's presentation and discussion. Hello, Ibu Hana. Are you on standby? Yes, I am here. Good morning, okay. everyone. Good morning. It's very nice to meet you, and I'm very happy to have you here as my partner today. Thank you. Pleasure is mine, too. <laughs> okay, Buhana. Okay, everyone, as we talk about the opportunity and the duty for a nutritionist worldwide a month ago, today we will have a very interesting theme as well and get a different point of view about the nutritional concern, both in developing and developed countries. As you may know that Indonesia and all countries around the world has more challenges to alleviate the nutritional concern. Besides the nutritional deficiency, we are now facing a triple burden malnutrition. And it is indeed not only affecting poor, but also rich countries. Therefore, the theme of discussion on this session is nutritional concern in the revolutionary industry 4.0. Okay, we divide today event into two sessions. So I will be the one uh, who moderate the first session and Ibu Hanna will greet you a bit later in the second session. The speaker for the first session is Professor Taro Yamauchi, PhD from Hokkaido University and Junko Hasegawa, PhD from Health Science University of Hokkaido. The topic that will be delivered are this very interesting one. Children living in the era of obese and low physical fitness, intergenerational change in Japanese children. And then the development of a screening tool to predict malnutrition among children under two years old in Zambia. While the speakers for second session will be Junaida Astina, SKZ, SKZ PhD candidate from Chualongkorn University and of course, our Dean from Faculty of Public Health in our university, Ibu Mia Srimiati SKZ MSE, with the topic on non-communicable disease prevention and hidden hunger in Indonesia. Okay, everyone, before I start with the first speakers, I would like to do a documentation. So I, info, uh, I will invite all of you, the speakers and the organizing committee uh, to take the group picture together. So everyone, please turn on our video for a moment and get ready for the screen capture. So the committee will be ready to do the screen capture. Okay, I will count to three. One, two, three, say cheese. All right, one more time. One, two, three. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, but before we meet our distinguished guest speaker, let me explain a bit about the presentation term and rule. So each speaker will give their presentation about the related topic and viewers keep their attention during the presentation. The presentation will be about 20 minutes. Then after that, we will have a question and answer, or I'd say a discussion session. However, during the presentation, you will have the opportunity to submit the questions for today's presenter by typing your questions into the comment pane, or you can click uh, the link that will be provided by the committee later during the presentation. And we, the organizing, uh, the organizing committee, will collect those and select the two until three questions for each presenters, for each speakers, 
and will be addressed during the Q&A session at the end of, uh, after the presentation of the speakers too. So please do insert your full name and where is your, uh, where is your institution and what is your question and who is the speakers that you want to address with this question. And also as usual, I want to inform you again, during the presentation, you may capture our interesting moments and post in your Instagram story and you should tag Prodigizi Binawan and Universitas Binawan and two lucky persons will get a diet plate or Piringizi as your giveaway gift. So don't miss it, guys. Okay, everyone, I'm sure that you can wait any longer to meet our first distinguished speaker. So uh, let me show you the information related to the Professor Taro Yamauchi PhD. So please do the screen share. All right. Okay, so Professor Taro Yamauchi PhD is a professor from Hokkaido University and also a professor, uh, a professor from a Research Institute for Humanity and Nature in Kyoto, Japan. He graduated from Bachelor in Health Science, University of Tokyo, and continued his study in Health Science Graduate School of Medicine from School of International Health for his master and doctoral degree. His field of work are human ecology, global health, biological anthropology, and human nutrition. He begins his academic career since 1998 up to now, from a part-time lecturer until become a professor in Hokkaido University. He is also actively engaged in many research projects worldwide, such as in Papua New Guinea, Solomon Island, Africa, Indonesia, so far, so forth. Please welcome Professor Taro Yamochi, PhD. Yamochi Sensei, are you ready for your presentation? Yes. Thank you, Lena san, for your kind introductions. Good morning, everyone. Okay. Uh, Good morning. Let me start sharing my screen. Okay. Okay, can you hear me? Can you see my PowerPoint? Okay. Uh, not yet. Oh. Yet. Coming. Yeah, as I I see, but you will you will do a full screen capture. Yes, I I did screen full share. screen. Yes. No, can you? Okay. Answer? Is it okay? Not yet. Not yet. Oh. Not yet. How about this? Uh, okay, it's 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 already full screen. Okay. Okay. Okay, uh, good good morning again everyone. Uh First of all, I'd like to express my sincere thanks to Lina San and the organizing committee, Binawan University, for inviting me to speak here today. I am Taro Yamauchi from Hokkaido University, Sapporo, Japan. I have been conducting field research for nearly 30 years in the small societies from rural villages, urban slums, and hunt together societies around the world. But today, I'd like to talk about childhood obesity and low physical fitness, focusing on intergenerational changes in Japanese children. My presentation consists of four parts. First, briefly, I will talk about the current global situation concerning child obesity and physical fitness. Second, I'd like to explain the secular changes in body size and physical fitness of Japanese children with intergenerational comparisons. Then 
I'd like to briefly describe the lifestyle of children in a hunter-gatherer society. Lastly, I will discuss the mitigation and prevention of child food obesity and low physical fitness. Let me start with the global trend of child obesity and low physical fitness. This is a systematic analysis of the global prevalence of overweight and obesity from 1980 to 2013. As you can see, there have been substantial increases in the prevalence among adults and children in both developed and developing countries for these 33 years. Globally, the prevalence of overweight and obesity combined has risen by 27.5% for adults and 47.1% for children between 1980s and 2013. The increase in obesity in developed countries has stabilized over the last 10 years. In contrast, the increase in obesity has continued in developing countries. Although the prevalence of obesity is higher in developed countries than in developing countries overall, 64%, two in three of world's obese live in developing countries. It is widely believed that the performance of children on physical fitness tests is declining. Here we have the results of a meta-analysis on the performance of children aged six to 19 years who have used the 20 meter shuttle run test. Among the 11 Western countries, such as Australia, Belgium, Canada, France, Greece, Italy, Northern Ireland, North Ireland, Netherlands, Northern Ireland, Poland, Spain, and United States. There has been a significant decline in performance of 0.43% per year. You may think 0.43% is small decline, but when we consider for 20 years, it is more than 8%. And I think it is serious decline. Increasing obesity and declining physical fitness in children has also reported in Asian countries. Here, I picked up studies in China, Korea, and Taiwan as examples. Tompkinson and colleagues conducted a systematic review involving long distance learning performance between 1964 and 2009. The performance consistently declined overall, but the patterns of change were different at the national level. Large declines were observed in children from China and Korea. Small declines were observed in children from Japan. And very small declines were observed in children from Singapore. Now let's move on to the body size and the physical fitness of Japanese children. The data source is the school health survey, which started in the year 1900, 120 years ago, as a nationally representative survey of Japanese school children. Based on a randomly extracted sample of schools, SHS has provided nationally representative data on height and weight for school children aged 6 to 17 year old. First, I'll show you the rates of obese boys from 6 to 14 year old in 10 year intervals, such as 1985, 95, 2005, and 2015. Here, you can see the rates of obesity increasing from 1985 up to 2005, but dropping down in 2015 in all ages. In Japan, people believe that child body size 
continue to increase over the generations. Namely, they gradually increase from grandparents, parents, and children. But how does it apply in reality? Next, I'm going to compare height and weight between three generations, such as grandparents, parents, and children. Here is the average height for grandparents, 1960s, parents, 1985, and current children, 2015, concerning eight, 11, and 14-year-old children. As expected, height largely increased from 1960 to 1985. In other words, from the grandparent generation to the parent generation. As you can see, height also increased in the ch child generation compared to that of their parent generation, but the increase was much smaller than between grandparent and parent generations. The same tendency was found in body weight. We see considerable increases between grandparent and parent generations compared to slight increases between parent and child generations. If the trend remains, increases in the mean height and weight of Japanese children shall stop sooner or later. When and to what extent will the body size of Japanese children increase? Let's look at the trends after the Second World War. This graph shows the secular change in height for 17.5 year old boys and girls. Here we see a rapid increase in height after an era of spectacular economic growth began in 1954, nine years after the war ended. However, the secular change in height was completed during the first half of 1990s. Interestingly, those who were born after 1973 and within five years had a peak height at age 17.5 years between 1990 and 1995. A similar trend was observed in weight change. After the war, the mean weight increased rapidly and achieved a peak between 1995 and 2005. Then the weight tended to decrease, especially in boys. As I explained earlier, the rate of obesity also started to decrease around 2005. When we look at the economic situation in Japan, after the post-war rapid economic growth ended in 1973, then the economic growth slowed down about for, for about 10 years. And then the so-called bubble economy started in 1986 and lasted for five years. Those who were born during the bubble economy period had a peak weight at age 17.5 between 2003 and eight. It is not easy to conclude because so many factors could influence on child growth, but we can say there exists relation between national economic situation and child growth. I'd like to summarize the secular changes in height and weight concerning Japanese children. Although body size increased after the Second World War, the increase in height stopped during the first half of 1990s and stabilized thereafter. Weight reached a peak during 1995 and 2005 and tended to decline, decline during the last 10 years. Now let's move on to the physical fitness of Japanese children. As you may know, the Olympics was expected to held in Tokyo, Japan this year. However, 
it was postponed to the next year because of COVID-19 pandemic. Unfortunately, the pandemic does not seem to end in the next year. By the way, do you remember when the Olympics were previously held in Tokyo, Japan? Yes, it was in 1964 and the Ministry of Education had started a school-based national examination on the physical fitness of children, Japan fitness test. In 1999, test items were renewed and the target age extended to the elderly, 79 years old. Current test items include grip strength, sit-ups, sit and reach, side step, 50 meter shadow run, uh, 50 meter run, standing long jump softball or handball throw, 20 meter shadow run, and endurance run. I'd like to focus these three tests later. I'm going to compare the performance of the fitness test for current children and their parent generation in 11 year old boys and girls for selected measurements. As I mentioned, grip strength, 50 meter run and softball throw conducted with both old and new test batteries. As you can see, the performance was clearly lower in current children than in their parent generation in all three tests. We found a significant generation gap in test performance. However, when we looked at the last 10 years, the decline was reduced and varied in each test. The decline continued in grip strength, but recovered in 50 meter run and stabilized in softball throw. Because time is limited, I will briefly point out emerging issues regarding body size and fitness of current Japanese children. These are low BMI in young women and sleep deprivation. The graphs illustrate secular changes in BMI by gender and age group. As you can see on the left panel, men's BMI tended to increase over time in all age groups, except for the 17-year-old age groups. As we observed before, although height has been stable, weight has decreased in recent years. In contrast, women's BMI on the right panel shows various changes by age group, a positive to negative BMI change occurred around the end of the rapid economic growth during 1973, involving those in their 30s and 40s. It was delayed for two and three decades for those in their 50s and 60s, respectively. I'd like to draw your attention to the BMI trends for those aged 17-year-old girls and those in their 20s, Surprisingly, the BMI for 17-year-old girls has been stable since 1947. More surprisingly, the BMI for those in their 20s has decreased over time and has fallen to the bottom of all age groups. Fortunately, it appeared to have increased since 2010 and moving forward, such low BMIs in young women are unique and unlike any other high income countries. Next, sleep deprivation. According to a large survey, more than 30% of grade seven to 11, 12 students slept less than six hours per day. The prevalence increased with age for both boys and girls. Lastly, I'm going to discuss mitigation and prevention of childhood obesity and low physical fitness. I'd like to introduce our small scale study of lifestyle and behavior pattern among hunter-gatherer children very quickly. I have been conducting field research in small societies of pygmy hunter-gatherers 
living in the African rainforests for 25 years. Hunter-gatherer children do not go to school and their daily activities mostly involve playing with their friends outside. They like to imitate adult subsistence activities, namely boys do fishing and hunting and girls gathering and bale fishing. 33 boys and 36 girls, no, 97 boys and 108 girls wore small GPS units and an accelerometer with a built-in pedometer for three consecutive days. Surprisingly, the mean daily steps exceeded 20,000 counts and 94% of obtained daily steps were greater than the counts involving developed countries, children, and international recommendations. It was almost double. I think it is difficult to have such large daily steps for children living in modern societies, even in Indonesia. They have to go to school and sit down for long hours. But walking is a fundamental movement for humans. And I'd like to stress the importance of walking to prevent obesity improving physical fitness and promote healthy growth for children. There are evidence that an individual connection to nature is associated with health and well-being. For more than 25 years, Japanese researchers have conducted research called Shinrin Yoku or forest air bathing and revealed that walking in a forest environment could provide a lifting mood and reduce objective markers of stress physiology. Based on extensive experiences in fieldwork concerning traditional societies, I'd like to point out the importance of the connection to nat natural environments and unstructured play. I speculate that encourage, encouraging children to play in natural environments has enormous potential to prevent obesity and improve physical fitness for children. I'd like to finish by making the following points. First, childhood obesity and decreasing physical fitness are globally widespread. We also found that for Japanese children, the secular increase in height stopped during the 1990s Similarly, weight and rate of obesity also reached their peaks, but then reduced during the last 10 years. Physical fitness level of Japanese children achieved a peak around 1985, and thereafter, the physical fitness level has declined, but stabilized in the last 10 years. So we can conclude that obesity and physical fitness of Japanese children tended to recover during the last 10 years, but emerging issues appeared, such as low BMI for young women. Finally, through experience in field work among hunter-gatherer children, I would like to stress, children should be encouraged to walk often, engage in unstructured play outdoors, and connect with nature. That's all I have to say today. Thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Yamauchi Sensei, for your presentation. Now, uh, everyone, we all have an insight about what is actually the nutritional concern also in Japan. In Indonesia, even though the nutritional deficiency is commonly found, but actually right now Indonesia has also shown uh, the similar trend like in Japan because the higher socioeconomic factor and rapid change on modern lifestyle and recent global nutrition dynamic is causing a nutrition shift. Less of walking and low physical fitness is the main problem that occur in uh, almost all uh, country in the world. 
and playing in the nature, which is a really, really fun right now because all of the field uh, in the world has been fulfilled with uh, building and uh, streets. So it's very difficult for them to play in the nature. And then playing in the nature uh, should be the potential countermeasure for that. So, um, okay, so for everyone who has question for Yamochi Sensei, you can type and send in your question in the link that provided in the YouTube streaming comments pane. And we will talk about this last, uh, after the second speakers. So let's move to the second speakers. Hasegawa Sang, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Okay, so I would like to introduce Hasegawa Sang first. So Hase, uh, Junko Hasegawa, PhD, she is a lecturer in Health Sciences University of Hokkaido, Japan. She has many research experience in Japan and Africa. Her research fields are frailty among elderly and child nutrition. She graduated from Sapporo Medical University, School of Health Science, Hokkaido University for her undergraduate program, and Hokkaido University Graduate School of Health Sciences for her master and doctoral program. She did her research in Zambia, Africa, and in Tobetsu Town, Japan. Please welcome Junko Hasegawa, PhD. I guess I should call you Hasegawa Sensei now as well, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay, Hasegawa, so are you ready for your presentation? Okay, let me share. Okay, you have 20 minutes. Please go ahead with your presentation. Okay. You can see this, right? Okay, let me start. Okay. Thank you for your warm introduction, Ms. Lina san Okay, first, first of all, I'd like to express my sincere appreciation to Lina san and organizing committee Binawan University. I'm very glad to be here today. Today, I'm going to talk about children's nutritional status in Zambia. So let's begin. Okay, let me introduce myself first. My name is Junko Hasegawa, as Lina san introduced. I'm a physical therapist. I'm a lecturer at a private university in Japan. As shown on the slide, as my research topics, I'm interested in frailty and child nutrition. Some of you may think why nutrition, even though I'm a physical therapist, because nutrition is an important base of overall health. Today, I'm going to share a screening tool to predict nutritional status as a product of my research in Zambia with you. As shown on the slide, I used to work in two African countries as Japanese volunteer. This volunteer experience made me start to conduct the field research in Zambia. After coming back from the volunteer work, I joined the Human Ecology Lab uh, led by first speaker, Professor Yamauchi Sensei. So the source of the present, today's presentation is this paper. It's an open access journal, so you can read it if you're interested in. As you see on the slide, uh, title of the paper, I made the, a screening tool to predict malnutrition. This malnutrition refers to stunting. So next, let's review a few common parameters of child growth. As you may already know, stunting is one of the most common indices of child growth. Stunting is the impaired growth and development that children experience, experience from poor nutrition, repeated infection, 
and inadequate psychosocial stimulation. Children are defined as stunted if their height for age is too short. In detail, more than two standard deviation below the WHO child growth standards median. Stunting in early life has adverse functional consequences on the child, particularly in the first 1,000 days from conception until the age of two. My topic is a screening tool to predict malnutrition. So why do we need a screening tool? In some African countries, there's a shortage of health care workers. Instead, people called community health workers are active. Community health workers are not professionals, but local residents who have been trained for a certain period of, period of time. While community health worker plays an important role in areas with few medical professionals, on the other hand, sometimes it's difficult for them to make clinical decision. So therefore, I thought it would be great if there was an easy to use screening. Here's my research hypothesis. When I was in Burkina Faso as, uh, as a Japanese volunteer, I often saw a scene of weight measurement of small children. When a malnourished child is found, according to the weight measurement, that's when an intervention starts. It means the nutritional condition has already bad when people start taking action to improve the nutritional condition. So I thought it was too late. As you can imagine, Children's food intake and their health condition depends on their living environment. I thought uh, that it might help detecting a risk of malnutrition by not only body measurement, but also adding some information such as living environment or mother's nutrition as shown on the slide. If we can detect children with high risk of malnutrition, we can take action earlier before the situation getting worse. So now let me introduce Zambia. As you can see on the slide, Zambia is located in Southern East Africa. Copper is an important industry for them as shown the picture at the bottom, of, bottom left. Most of the people works as a farmer uh, it is one of the least developed country in the world. This picture shows a typical house at my research site. I think this helps you to imagine lifestyle there. This is a health center located at the study site. So the participants of the study was 264 pairs of the child and mother who visited the health center on the previous slide. I measured child and mother and interviewed the mother about their living environment. So I will skip the detail of the analysis, but I found these seven items to be important predictors to detect stunting children. Let's say them one by one. First age, one year or more. Then second, low weight for age. Then third, multiple births, that is to say twins or triplets. Then fourth, unrecommended feeding status. So it means when feeding status is not recommended by WHO guideline. Then Fifth, low birth weight. It means less than 2.5 kg of birth weight. Then six, history of uh, child's older sister or brother's death. Then at last, low mother's education level. So I'd like to focus on a few points among them. 
So first, unrecommended feeding status. I define unrecommended feeding status following WHO child feeding guidelines. According to the guideline, there are three recommendations. First, exclusive breastfeeding until six months old. And second, start solid food around six months old. Third, continue breastfeeding until two years old even after starting solid food. So for example, if a child is given solid food before six months old, we can say it is unrecommended feeding status. According to a WHO report, half of the nutrition comes from breast milk in children six to 12 months old, even after starting a complementary food. Uh, even for children older than one year, it is said that one third of nutrition comes from breast milk. The WHO guidelines recommended, uh, recommends continuing breastfeeding until two years old. Uh, actually, I have 10 months old daughter, so I do breastfeeding for her. But in Japan, it seems that many people stop breastfeeding around one year old. How about Indonesia? So as of 2010, 6.5% of Japanese children under five are stunting. A breastfeeding may be even more important in countries like Zambia, where the proportion of stunting children is high. In Zambia, as their staple food is maize, Complementary food is also mainly from maize. Some family cook maize porridge using only maize, although it's recommended to add some oil, beans, or nuts, like something nutritious. Of course, it depends on the economic condition of the family, but sometimes it depends on awareness of the importance of complementary food. So next, I'd like to focus on mother's education level. It is pointed out as one of the risk factors of stunting. But how come? What's the relationship between mother's education level and the children's nutritional status? So if the mother is not educated, she will not be able to literate and or calculate then she does not get the correct health-related knowledge. Even if the child becomes ill, it may not be possible to determine the need for medical examination or to take appropriate care. Similarly, children may not be given balanced diet. As I said once, but what children eat totally depends on their living environment and mother may be the biggest influencer for them. This is quite simple two by two tablet table, but uh, let me explain. Uh, this with and without means if a mother has a children's uh, birth weight information. If the mother knows child's birth weight is shown with it means with information. If she doesn't know it, it's shown without. As the birth weight is quite basic health information for a baby, we normally know and keep the information. So I divided mothers into two categories by education level. One is a secondary school or higher education. And the other is at least primary. This group include mothers who never go to schools or drop out. Among mothers who went secondary school or higher, most of the mother, no, uh, mother knew the birth weight. 97.2% of mothers. On the other hand, um, this group more than 30% of mothers who didn't have enough opportunity to go to school 
they didn't know their child's birth rate. It means uh, they gave birth at home or on the way to a hospital, but some mothers lost the given information. This data is just an example, but we can guess that education is quite important for maintaining health. So now uh, let me change the topic a bit. This is just an extra information. When I developed uh, the screening tool, I actually developed uh, a tool that uses a tablet device. I'd like to show you the actual screen. It looks like this. So from top, enter sex, uh, weight, birth weight, then blah, blah, blah. Then tap the calculate button. So calculated length for age and uh, some comments are displayed. In this case, uh, it's shown careful follow-up needed. So I did a survey in Zambia between 2013 and 14. So it's a while back, but even at that time, mobile phones were quite popular. Smartphone one uh, may be only found in the capital, but now smartphone users should be increasingly considerably. I felt uh, that paper-based screening to didn't work well. Why? So first, the medical records were kept by the residents. So some broke the record, some lost, some left at home. Uh, the situation was something like that. So second, I saw people often make mistakes in simple calculation. At this time, details are omitted in this presentation, but we need to do simple addition to use the screening tool. On the slide, it is uh, written as complicated calculation, but actually it's simple addition, but there were many cases of mistake. So therefore, I thought that it would be better if the result was displayed automatically after entering the information. I think it is important to consider usability for continuous implementation. Okay, so this is the last slide. Let me summarize uh, a bit. I introduced seven items related to the nutritional status of children from a survey in Zambia. Those items included not only what they are eating, what they are having, but also their living background. And lastly, I added that on-site usability is also an important point in the implementation. Okay, thank you for your attention. Let me close the slide. Okay, Lina san Okay, thank you very much for your presentation, Hasegawa san I totally agree with you that uh, breastfeeding plays a crucial role to protect children not only from malnutrition, but also from infections. Unfortunately, not everyone were aware about that. Indeed, I also experienced that uh, while I'm living in Japan, uh, mothers mostly ask why I'm still do the breastfeeding up to two years. Mm -hmm. So it's a very strange maybe for them to see uh, women to do the breastfeeding even though the child already uh, grow up, something like that. So indeed, in low-income countries such as in Africa, in Zambia, Malawi, and etc., we may see that uh, nutritional deficiency perhaps is severe, and even though the screening procedure for detecting uh, malnutrition seems easy, but not everyone understands and somehow ignores them. It is really interesting to have uh, the application, the software for the nutritional status screening in your tablet. Oh, may I ask? May I have one, Hasegawa-san? <laughs> Where can I download the application? <laughs> Does it need an internet connection for that? 
I no that tablet uh, no not really oh that's really convenient for us when we do like a field survey so we can directly uh, determine their nutritional it's status it's like a local network only between pc laptop and tablet right okay all right uh viewers and audience you may type your questions on the link that is provided by the committee in the comment pens to be addressed to uh, Ms. Hasegawa from uh, Health Science uh, of Hokkaido. All right. So everyone, uh, since we just finished the second speakers, we will now begin the question and answer session. So we will have 15 minutes for a question and answer session and it will be divided into speakers and each speaker will receive around two to three questions. And then, so I will uh, first read the question for Professor Yamauchi. Okay. Uh, okay. So Yamauchi Sensei, there are three questions that I received from the audience. Mm -hmm. Uh, question one is from Nanda Isna from Poltekkes, kind of a health college or a health academy in Indonesia from Malang. So the question is, uh, do you have a suggestion for, the, for us, the nutrition students, to overcome the, uh, the trend of obesity or to prevent or to alleviate the in existing case of obesity in Indonesia? Mm -hmm. Thank you for the good question. Uh, I think uh, now Indonesia is uh, the rate of uh, obesity increasing in my understanding, particularly urban area or even in rural area, rural villages, the rate of obesity increasing. Uh, I think uh, the important point is food and diet literacy, the knowledge and attitude and practice, we, uh, sometimes we say KAP, knowledge, attitude, and practice about food and dietary diet. So uh, that means uh, people usually want to have the modern food or uh, kind of McDonald's, yes, fast food, but actually the traditional food is very healthy and nutritious. So it's important to, uh, tell people yes, such kind of uh, information, kind of education is important. Thank you. Okay, I agree with you that uh, we are now facing the trend of consuming a fast food and a modern foods. So it's better for us to swift and to change back to the traditional food that will be a natural, less uh, additive uh, food additive and so on. Yes, but uh, please uh, consider uh, about the micro micronutrient deficiency at the same time. Okay. Yes, that's true. Okay, for the question number two, this is from Supriyandi Sianturi from Binawan University. So the question is, Japan is one of the country that has a very high level of quality of life and also uh, health and health service standards, such as a good uh, food intake by regulating food, starting from kindergarten and then elementary school and so far so forth. So what is the factor actually that affects the increasing of obesity rate in children in Japan even though the government and the academic institution already had a regulation for their meal. So what is actually the factor for that, Sensei? Thank you very much. As I explained now, uh, these 10 years or more, Japan, uh, the obesity, rate of obesity decreasing, decreasing. But uh, when we look back uh, 1970s, 1980s and 1990s, 
Japan experienced rapid economic growth like Indonesia and China. At that time, uh, as I mentioned, uh, fast food and uh, westernized food are very popular and young children want to eat and their mothers are easy to allow the babies and children to take such kind of Western food. But now, uh, fortunately, um, Japan, uh, the kind of health conscious, health consciousness, as, and uh, the rates of obesity decreasing. But in, at the same time, now in Japan, facing our malnutrition. Yes, that sounds uh, surprisingly. Yes, yeah, even for young women and children, they want to be slim maybe due to the mass media influence. Yes, so they are extremely want to be a slim body size. That's a kind of a cultural uh, impact and uh, also mass media. So I think uh, in Japan is now the opposite problems happened. But as uh, Lina san mentioned, uh, we have a strict law, strict rules of school lunch services. Yes, as, a, as, as the question mentioned, uh, even for kindergartens. So I think it's also, yes, good, yes, prevalent from uh, being uh, overweight. Thank you. Okay, so Sensei, is there any other uh, program from the government to prevent uh, their community to become malnutrition from the Japanese uh, not, government? Not perhaps? so much uh, because diet is uh, basically, as you know, Japanese food, traditional Japanese food is one of the most healthy food around the world. So we are very lucky to have such a culture on food and diet in Japan. But uh, the physical activities, as I mentioned in my talk, that children uh, do not walk often. They use uh, public transportation. And as you know, the cars and auto automobiles, bikes, uh, many, many. So very dangerous to play outside. So the Japanese government and local government have uh, encouraged to uh, young children to play outside and walk more often to go to school, for example. Thank you. Okay, I also remember that in our uh, living and in surrounding our living environment, there are so many like playground for children yes. so they can, yes, actively play during the their leisure time. So maybe yes. it will help as well. Even in a very small places, Cohen. Yes. yes, thank you. And then the question three, uh, this is from Mahmoud Aditya Rifki from Elanga University. And his question is that I would like to ask Professor Taya Moichi about malnutrition, about most the parents in developing countries, including Indonesia, believe that malnutrition is only about genetic or heredity. They ignore food intake nutrition knowledge, hygiene, and sanitation, etc. So I would like to ask you the best way to deal with this problem. Thank, Thank you. you for your uh, good questions. As, as, I as I reply at my first questions, the kind of education, I don't want to mention education because education to me, it's a kind of top down from uh, higher people tell lower people. So I'm not, I don't know, so, but I don't want to use education, but kind of education from bottom up. Bottom up approach is important. So I mean, uh, so one idea is not like a lecture, but action research or active learning. The local people themselves do research and uh, discuss each other, focus group discussions and then um, they, uh, they are getting a higher knowledge about true or scientific evidence about nutrition. I think that's important. The bottom-up approach is 
one of the effective way, I believe. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Yamoji Sensei, for your uh, answer for the following questions. So it's uh, underlined some important points to alleviate the nutritional problems, not only in Japan, but also in Indonesia. Perhaps we Indonesians uh, can uh, imitate or improve our uh, nutritional programs uh, with, with uh, learning from what the developed country already started. So thank you very much, Sensei. Thank you. So, let me continue to the next uh, speakers. So the question for Hasegawa-san. Hasegawa-san, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Okay, Hasegawa-san, I already have three questions for you. So I will read uh, one by one. Okay. So the first question is from Idewa Nyoman. Supriyasa from Poltekas Kemen Kasmalang. So the question is, what the main causes of stunting? Please uh, briefly explain about it and what the appropriate intervention to combat of stunting from your point of view. Okay, thank you for the question. As uh, I showed uh, in my presentation, stunting is a uh, impaired growth and development from poor nutrition and repeated infection and inadequate psychosocial stimulation. So what we can do is uh, to uh, this, the cause is these three. So poor nutrition and repeated infection. So to, for about that point, I think breast milk, as Linasan mentioned, Mm, for my presentation's comment, breast milk, to feed breast milk is a uh, one of the uh, solution com to combat stunting. Especially mm, from conception until two years old, this uh, 1000 days is the most important. So the breastfeeding is much to the period to, for this 1,000 days. Okay. Okay. Mm. Okay, let me continue to the second question. So the second question is uh, Supriyandi Sianturi from Universitas Binawan. So he said, good morning, Miss Junko Hasegawa. I'm Supriyandi Sianturi. <laughs> Uh, I would like to ask questions regarding uh, stunting and nutrition. Um, how to find solution? As you mentioned, uh, the breast milk is the best solution to prevent stunting. But uh, if the breast milk is not available or the mother cannot uh, produce or something happened with her health, so they, uh, they cannot do the breastfeeding to their child. So it will be recommended for them to drink uh, formula milk, do you think? Mm. And for the low, uh, low economic countries, like in Africa and somewhere else uh, in this world, uh, do you think uh, they can afford to buy the formula milks as the prevention to stunting. Do you think, do you agree with that? And then if some children already experience stunting, uh, do you have any suggestion for that? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Mm, if the breast milk is not available, yes, it happens. But yes, in that case, formula milk, artificial milk can take place. Mm. Some, it's maybe it's difficult to buy uh, such kind of milk, especially um, for in a developing country, it's, um, I can say it's expensive. 
but uh, if uh, the mother cannot afford to buy those milk, some, um, I, I'm not sure if from government or uh, some NGOs such as uh, Med, uh, MSF is uh, that uh, Doctors Without Borders in English, mm. such kind of organization can provide appropriate, appropriate milk to the mothers. And I saw some mothers are given such kind of milk and feed the children. Okay. Okay, so I want to uh, like uh, confirm that if a mother really cannot provide the breast milk, perhaps the only solution is uh, giving them the formula milk. But uh, of course we need like um, medical reason for that, right? Mm -hmm. And then perhaps in Indonesia, I want to share also with you that uh, we we here in Indonesia has like a breast milk dinner. So mm -hmm. breast milk dinner, perhaps for a mother who cannot produce their own milk, they can find some a breast milk mother, uh, I mean a breast milk uh, dinner from uh, other mothers. So we can help uh, those with uh, lacking to produce the breast milk. So perhaps it will help as well in other developing countries. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, I not, it was not in Zambia, but when I was in Burkina Faso, I saw um, not uh, like uh, donation, but uh, some friends or grandmother, they were breastfeeding. Mm. So maybe it happens. Yeah, so they share their milk, right? <laughs> I, I, I've never uh, heard or I've never seen in Japan. Yeah, I think. Mm. I think in Japan, maybe they will just switch to <laughs> formula milk, right? Excuse me. I think Japan, it has such kind of culture long time ago before World War, for yeah. example. Oh, yeah, really? Traditionally, even rural villages. Yeah. Yes, there's a main, yes, in Japan, we have a term, Uba. Mm -hmm. Uba means... Uh, just a mother who are not really mother, but give <laughs> their milk. Hmm. Thank you. Yeah. So in Japan, so. there is also a culture to be, uh, to like uh, donate their breast milk to other child, right? Sensei. Yeah. But the culture is uh, has changed right now. Yes. Okay. <laughs> So there is a third question, Hasegawa-san. So this is from Adolf Danuata from a healthcare center in Indonesia. How to improve mother's knowledge of nutrition? I, re I realized that mothers in Indonesia as uh, equal as Zambia to have low level of education. So do you think you have a suggestion to improve the mother's knowledge for their uh, nutrition education. Okay, what uh, actually take place in Zambia and also Malawi, Burkina Faso too? They sometimes uh, like clinic, uh, hospital staff, or community health workers, uh, as I introduced, they organize a cooking seminar for mothers. They cook um, nutritious food and they serve the mothers. So a lot of mothers gather and they join cook, cooking and they eat what they prepare, then they taste it. Normally, I think it's free. So mothers uh, gather and they learn which kind of food is nutritious, is good for child, and they can also taste at that time. And uh, mm, they take those recipes at home. Then they prepare for, the, for their kids. That's, I think, common, one of the common ways 
to um, share the, the that kind of knowledge. Yeah, I think it's very interesting to have mothers uh, cooking together in the field or in uh, some location in their village or cities. And maybe we can also combine with Yamauchi Sensei's suggestions <laughs> before. Yeah, so during the cooking time, maybe we can discuss and gather yeah. their idea how to improve uh, their nutrition uh, knowledge, such kind of thing. So they can like, <laughs> um, making their own solution for mm. that. I, I, I agree with uh, Hasegawa-san. Yes, actually, mm. there's uh, many a uh, variety of women's associations mm -hmm. in all over the world. It's like uh, Pekaka in Indonesia. Yes, yes, that's true. I think it can give local mothers good opportunities to learn nutrition knowledge. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes, that's true. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Yamoji Sensei and Hasegawa san. Very well, everyone. I think all questions has got the answers. And I'm very happy to have Yamoji Sensei and Hasegawa san here that spared your precious time and share your experience and expertise in nutrition with us. You've been great and gave crucial state of nutrition in the face of the revolutionary industry among developed and developing countries. Yet we should note that the transformation and changing face of the world with higher financial capacity does not guarantee a population to be free from nutritional problems. However, it will define the type of malnutrition problem that may occur. Great everyone, Please don't go anywhere after this because we will move to the second session with Buhana Nabila and Phil as your moderator. And of course, the topic will do enhance your knowledge and inspire you guys to create, for instance, a research topic or a program to address this matter. Hello, Ibu Hana. Hello. Hello, are you ready? Yes, I, I am very ready. And I would like to say thank you so much for Mr. Taro and Miss Junko. That was amazing. I learned a lot. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. So thank you for staying with me in the first session and see you again. Okay, Buhana, the floor is yours. Thank you. Okay, hello everyone. Good morning or good afternoon. I am Hannah and I will be your moderator for the second session. As you know, we have four speakers today. And thank you so much for Ibulina for conducting such wonderful first sessions. And without further ado, we are going to continue our discussions and our online talk. But before that, let me remind you to fill in the link if you have any questions uh, later. Uh, after both of the third and fourth speakers have presented their presentation. And moreover, don't forget to take a screenshot and share it because you may get a chance of winning Piringizi, like a nutritional plate, which could be very interesting. Okay, so now let me call our third speaker, uh, Miss Junaida, or can I call you Miss Junda? Hello, we finally meet. Hello, Ibu Hana. Hi. It's very nice to meet you. And hello to Ibu Mia. I, hello, I can... Miss Hana. Hi. Okay, so before you start your presentation, let me share a little bit more about you based on the CV. Okay, okay. thank you. So, Miss Junaida Astina, she is a PhD candidate in food and nutrition program in Chular. Chula Longkorn, I'm sorry if I pronounce it wrong, University in Thailand. And she is currently working on research related to fiber, interesting, resistant mm -hmm. maltodextrin, nutritional supplement, and metabolic health outcomes. And today she will present a topic entitled Balanced Nutrition for Non-Communicable Diseases or NCBS Prevention. Okay, so uh, Ms. Junda, are you ready? Yes, I'm absolutely ready. Thank you. Okay, the floor is yours. Thank you. 
Okay, thank you so much, Ibu Hana, for having me. And uh, let me share my screen. Wait a minute. Can you see my screen? Yes, and I think you have to make it full screen. Okay, okay, wait a minute. Is it okay now? Perfect. Okay, uh, let me uh, start. Let me start my presentation. First of all, I would like to say thank you, uh, Ibu Hana, and also Binawan University for the opportunity and for having me uh, and sharing with the other experts from Japan and also from Indonesia. Thank you so much. And good afternoon uh, to all of the professors and also all the colleagues. Uh, my name is Junaida Astina, and currently I'm taking my PhD in Food and Nutrition Program of Chulalongkorn University, Thailand. And today uh, I will share some information about the balanced nutrition for non-communicable disease prevention, or NCD. And here is my outline presentation for today. We will start from the introduction about the non-communicable disease or NCD, its prevalence, causes, and also the cutoff points of metabolic markers related to NCD, and continue to the role of nutrients in NCD, and wrap up with the balanced nutrition for NCD prevention. Let's start with the introduction. Uh, data from WHO showed that NCD killed about 41 million people per year, which is equivalent to 71% of all deaths globally, which is a huge number, right? And NCD are chronic disease tend to be long duration, and they are the result of combination of genetic, physiological, environmental, and also behavior factors. There are four most common causes of NCD death. The first one is cardiovascular disease, which was accounted for 17.9 million deaths per year, followed by cancers, 9 million deaths per year. The third is respiratory disease with 3.9 million deaths per year. And the fourth is diabetes with 1.6 million deaths per year. The impacts of NCD are more severe in the low and middle income countries, and majority of premature death also occur in low and middle income countries, which Indonesia is one of these countries. <laughs> there are some risk factors of NCD, uh, which is categorized into two. The first one is the modifiable risk factors. And the second one is metabolic risk factors. For the modifiable risk factors, we can change for a better health, uh, including unhealthy diets, harmful use of alcohol, physical inactivity, and also tobacco use. For the, uh, for the unhealthy diets, including high sodium intake and also high saturated fat intake, uh, should be reduced. High, high sodium intake contributed to 4.1 million deaths per year. For the harmful use of alcohol, it contributed to 3. Point, uh, harmful use of alcohol, it contributed to 3.3 million deaths per year. And physical inactivity contributed to 1.6 million deaths per year. And for the tobacco use, it contributed to 7.2 million deaths per year. Uh, for tobacco use, it not only affect to those who smoke, but also affect to those who are exposed to the smoke. And for the second risk factor is the metabolic risk factor, including increased blood pressure, obesity, hyperglycemia, and also hyperlipidemia. So those who are having this risk factor have higher risk of cardio uh, non-communicable diseases. As I mentioned earlier, there are some metabolic risk factors related to NCD. And here are the metabolic risk markers uh, related to NCD. The first one is the BMI or body mass index. The optimum uh, value or uh, the optimum number of body mass index for the adults, it should be about 18.5 to 25 kilogram per meter square. And for the lipid parameters, uh, normally we have LDL cholesterol, HDL cholesterol, triglycerides, and also fasting uh, total cholesterol uh, as a routine lab 
uh, to define the uh, hyperlipidemia. The optimum value of LDL cholesterol, it should be less than 100 milligram per deciliter. For the HDL cholesterol, it should be more than 50 milligram per deciliter for female. And for the male, it should be more than 40 milligram per deciliter. For the triglycerides, the optimum value, it should be less than 100 milligram per deciliter. And here are the glucose parameter. Uh, the normal, normal range of fasting plasma glucose, it should be uh, about 70 to 99 milligrams per deciliter. For the hemoglobin A1C, it detect the uh, accumulated blood uh, glucose in the blood. Uh, it should be about 4 to 5.6%. And for the fasting serum insulin, it should be less than 20 micro unit per milliliter. And for the optimum blood pressure is about uh, 120 per 80. Next, uh, we will going to discuss the role of nutrients uh, in NCD development and prevention. First of all, I would like to discuss about the carbohydrate because carbohydrate is the major composition in our daily diet, isn't it? We eat rice, potato, pasta, noodles every day. And actually there are many studies uh, investigated the white rice consumption and also type risk of type 2 diabetes. And this meta-analysis study showed that higher consumption of white rice is associated with an increased risk of type 2 diabetes, especially in Asian populations, because Asian population eat a lot of white rice every day. And it is also mentioned that 11 11% um, 11 uh, increased risk of diabetes uh, when we eat white rice consumption. One of the possible mechanisms is through the development of insulin resistance. As we know that uh, white rice is categorized as high glycemic index food and high glycemic index food can increase the blood glucose rapidly. As the blood glucose increase, the insulin will be released from our beta cell pancreas. Uh, to allow the glucose uptake into the cells and glucose utilization by the cells. However, chronic hyperglycemia can increase, uh, can impair the insulin receptor signaling. And therefore, the insulin cannot do their work to facilitate the glucose uptake into the cells. As a result, the blood glucose will remain high and the insulin level will remain high as well. Uh, it is known as the insulin resistance. Not only the quantity of the carbohydrate, the quality of carbohydrate also plays important role in maintaining normal blood glucose level. Dietary fiber is also a uh, carbohydrate, but it doesn't increase your blood glucose rapidly as much as white, white rice or high GI foods. This meta-analysis study showed that high fiber intake, uh, about 25 to 25, nine, uh, 25 to 29 gram per day of dietary fiber can significantly lower body weight, uh, decrease the systolic blood pressure, and also decrease the total cholesterol. It is recommended to consume about uh, 14 grams per 1,000 kilocalorie per day and higher intake of dietary fiber can protect against cardiovascular disease, type 2 diabetes, and also cancers. And this is one of my publication about the effect of resistant maltodextrin on blood glucose. So in this study, I use maltodextrin and also resistant maltodextrin. Uh, maltodextrin is partially hydrolyzed starch. And in this study, I use tapioca starch because tapioca is abundant in Thailand. And I also believe that we have a lot of tapioca in Indonesia as well. So uh, maltodextrin is usually used as the carbohydrate source 
in enteral formula or uh, sports drink because it gives a calorie about per kilocalorie per one gram, almost similar to glucose or sugar. However, maltodextrin is high GI. So I replaced the maltodextrin to resistant maltodextrin. Uh, resistant maltodextrin uh, looks like similar to maltodextrin, but uh, the structure of resistant maltodextrin has been modified. So resistant maltodextrin uh, is hardly digested by carbohydrate digestive enzymes. So it is uh, categorized as uh, non viscous soluble fiber. So maltodextrin is high GI, but resistant maltodextrin is low GI. So when what happened when we replace maltodextrin to resistant maltodextrin, the results show that replacement of digestible maltodextrin to resistant maltodextrin reduce the postprandial blood glucose and also reduce the postprandial insulin level in the healthy subjects. One of the possible mechanisms because of we decrease the available carbohydrate uh, in the resistant maltodextrin. Therefore, the postprandial blood glucose and insulin level will uh, decrease as well. And here are the possible mechanisms of dietary fiber in lowering postprandial blood glucose. Actually, there are many types of dietary fiber, including viscose and non viscose fiber fermentable and non-fermentable fiber, and also soluble and insoluble fiber. Uh, different type of fiber have different effect to our health. Uh, for example, for the viscous fiber, uh, it can make a gel-like structure in our stomach, so it can delay the gastric emptying and also delay the nutrition absorption. As the gastric emptying is delayed, it will stimulate the release of GLP-1 and also PYY. GLP-1 and also PYY are the hormones that is secreted by the intestinal cells that can stimulate the release of insulin. As the insulin increase, uh, the postprandial blood glucose will be decreased. And for the second one is the prebiotics or the fermentable fiber. Some types of fiber can be fermented by uh, gut microbiota in our stomach. Uh, fermentation of this kind of fiber can uh, produce the short chain fatty acids or SCFA. Uh, SCFA can stimulate the release of GLP-1 and PYY as well and therefore can stimulate the insulin secretion and lower the postprandial blood glucose. GLP-1 not only uh, lower the postprandial blood glucose but they also increase the satiety so it can make us feel more full after we eat uh, fiber. And fermentation of uh, prebiotics also increase the good microbiota in our colon. And it also increase the insulin sensitivity uh, for our health. And for the last one is the insoluble fiber. Insoluble fiber can increase the colonic transit time and can um, prevent, it, it, it helps to prevent the constipation. And the second one is the high fat foods. High fat foods are delicious, but it also associated with many metabolic diseases as high fat intake is less satiating compared to protein and it also have high calorie in density. So it stimulate the overconsumption or overeating for those people who eat the high fat foods. As we eat more of high fat food, it will increase the fat storage in our body, especially in obese people. High fat food also impair the insulin signaling and lead to insulin resistance. It also induces the endothelial dysfunction, which um, increased risk of hypertension and also cardiovascular disease. It also stimulates the chronic low-grade inflammation and changes in gut microbiota. It will increase the bad bacteria in our colon. Fat consumption is limited to 25 to 30% of total energy intake. And it is important to choose the type that we eat, the type of fat that we eat. 
uh, this study is interesting because uh, when trans fatty acid and also saturated fatty acid were substituted for total carbohydrate, the mortality increased by 31 and also 9% respectively. However, on the other hand, uh, when monounsaturated fatty acid and also polyunsaturated fatty acid were substituted for total carbohydrate, the mortality decreased by 10 and also 19%. And here is the possible mechanism. Different types of fats have different effects on human health. Polyunsaturated fatty acid and monounsaturated fatty acid can decrease the insulin resistance uh, and also in decrease the risk of uh, atherosclerosis. On the other hand, uh, saturated fatty acid can increase the insulin re resistance, increase the inflammation, and also increase risk of atherosclerosis. And the third one is the high sodium intake. As I mentioned earlier, that high sodium intake contributed to 4.1 million deaths from CVD per year. And currently, average people consume about 10 grams per day of salt. Um, as we know that salt consumption, more than five grams per day, increase risk of hypertension, heart disease, and also stroke. So we need to do something with the sodium. We need to lower the sodium intake to less than uh, four grams per day. And the last session is about the balanced nutrition for NCD prevention. In Indonesia, we have dietary guidelines, which is visualized into two. The first one is tumpeng gizi seimbang, or TGS, and the second one is isi piringku. To ensure people eat safe and variety of foods in proper amount. Tumpeng gizi seimbang mentioned about the serving of each food groups uh, that we need that we need to eat in one day, and it. In isi piringku, it describes the amount of the food groups that we need to eat in one serving. And this is the details of tumpeng gizi seimbang and isi piringku uh, for the portion of each food groups. Uh, for the half of the half of the plate, it should be from the carbohydrate and protein. But we need to consume more of carbohydrate. The carbohydrate it is accounted for one third of the plate. Uh, and in one day, we need to eat about three to four servings per day. And for the protein, it is about one sixth of the plate. And in one day, we need to consume about two to four servings per day. And another half of the plate, it should be from the fruits and vegetables. Uh, with vegetables should be consumed more than the fruits. Vegetable, uh, is accounted for one third of the plate. And in one day, we need to consume about three to four servings per day. For the rest of the plate, it should be from the fruits with two to, two to three servings per day. Additionally, we need to drink eight glasses of water per day to maintain our hydration status. And don't forget to wash your hand before and after eating. And it, if it uh, it is also recommended to limit our sugar intake to less than four tablespoons per day. For the salt, it should be less than one teaspoon per day. And for the fat, it should be limited to five tablespoons per day. As we know that the cholesterol in our body comes from endogenous cholesterol, which is produced from our body and from dietary or from food. Uh, for the majority of healthy people, dietary cholesterol or the food, the cholesterol that we get from the food did not significantly affect to the blood cholesterol. It is important to note that recent findings showed that the lack of evidence of association between dietary cholesterol and the cardiovascular disease. And there is insufficient evidence to determine whether the lowering dietary cholesterol can reduce the LDL cholesterol. However, care should be taken if you are hyper responder of dietary cholesterol or already having the dyslipidemia. Instead of lowering dietary cholesterol, it is recommended to replace your saturated fatty acid using unsaturated fatty acid. 
and it is recommended also to consume more of antioxidant rich foods because antioxidant rich foods can uh, improve our health uh, this one is the study of my friends that uh, investigated the effect of yogurt containing raspberry rice extract this is raspberry rice uh, it has a purple color and the yogurt that contain raspberry rice extract can decrease the postprandial blood glucose when compared to the control yogurt. Because the uh, anthocyanin in raspberry rice extract can inhibit the glucose absorption. And another study showed that consumption of 30 milliliter of rice bran oil with uh, gamma orizanol can improve the antioxidant status and also improve the lipid profile in hyperlipidemic subjects. Gamma orizanol is known to reduce the cholesterol level by inhibiting the cholesterol absorption and inhibit the cholesterol synthesis in our liver. And balanced diet not only means the balance in milk composition, but also means the balance between energy intake and output. It is recommended to the physical activity for at least 150 minutes per week. And here are the possible mechanisms of physical activity can decrease the NCD risk. It can decrease the adiposity, decrease the insulin and also glucose level, and decrease the sex hormone that can lead to the uh, risk can, uh, of cancer. Thank you so much for the time. And I will call Ibu Hana again. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Junda, for such an insightful presentation. I learned a lot. And I'm looking sure. forward for the question and answer sessions, hoping that we can have fruitful discussions because I took so much notes. Okay, so I have so questions much. too. Okay. Uh, I, I believe everyone is still here watching this uh, very nice presentation. Uh, event. So now let me give the floor to the Dean of Public Health of Binawan University, Ibu Mia. Hello, Ibu Mia. Hello, Miss Hana, Ibu Hana. Hi. Are you ready? Uh, I'm ready, inshallah. Okay. So let me announce the title of your presentation. It's challenges on ensuring dietary diversity as the determinant of hidden hunger in Indonesia. So you're going to present about hidden hunger. What is it in Bahasa Indonesia ya, Bu? Kelaparan, uh, kelaparan tersembunyi. Oh, kelaparan tersembunyi. Iya. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay, Bu Mia, the floor is yours. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ibu Hana. It is an honor having you as our moderator in our event. Uh, Ibu Hana, for your information audience, uh, Ibu Hana is a director of international affair in our university, Binawan University. She is also a director uh, of Binawan Training Center. Okay, thank you, uh, Ibu Hana. And uh, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Mia Srimiati. On this occasion, I was asked by the committee to explain uh, about challenges on ensuring dietary diversity as the determinant of hidden hunger in Indonesia. Next. Okay, here is the outline of my presentation. There are introduction, determinant of the burden of chronic and hidden hunger, Indonesian food and nutrition profile, and also challenges on ensuring dietary diversity, and Indonesian nutritional problem solving strategies, and uh, the last is conclusion. Next. Okay. Uh, hunger is classified into two categories, namely chronic hunger and hidden hunger. Chronic hunger is a condition when a person lack of micronutrient in the long period. In terms of calories, a while hidden hunger is often defined as a condition in which a person lacks of micronutrient intake. And worldwide, the most widespread micronutrient deficiencies are iron, zinc, vitamin A, 
iodine and folate but deficiencies of vitamin b12 and other b vitamins also commonly occur in developing countries multiple micronutrient deficiencies often occur concurrently in the same population as we know the sdgs aims to and all forms of hunger and malnutrition by 2030, making sure all people, especially children, having sufficient and nutrition and nutritious food all year. But to achieve this goal, it requires political commitment and knowledge about the type of action that can help to reduce different forms of hunger effectively. And why hidden hunger is important to be solved. Next, please. Because even mild to moderate deficiencies of micronutrients lead to impaired physical and cognitive development, poor physical growth, increased morbidity from infectious disease in infant and young children, and decrease work productivity in adulthood. Next. And here is the conceptual framework of the determinant of childhood undernutrition from UNICEF. Immediate causes of undernutrition are inadequate dietary intake and disease, child dietary intake and exposure to disease are affected by underlying factors, including household food insecurity, such as lack of availability, access and utilization, and inadequate care and feeding practices for children, unhealthy household and surrounding environment, and inaccessible and often inadequate health care. Basic cause of Poor nutrition encompass the societal structure and process uh, and processes that neglect human rights and perpetuate poverty, limiting or denying the access of vulnerable population to essential resources. Social, economic, and political factor can have a long-term influence on maternal and childhood undernutrition. Moreover, chronic undernutrition can lead to poverty and finally creating a vicious cycle. Next, please. And here is the determinant of the burden of chronic and hidden hunger. First, the role of economic growth and demographic trends. Why? Because regression results indicate that higher per capita GDP or gross domestic product is strongly associated with a lower burden of chronic and hidden hunger. For your information, 1% increase in GDP is associated with a 0.4 until 0.5% decrease in the burden of chronic hunger and 0.2 until 0.3% decrease in the burden of hidden hunger. And the second is the role of political and environmental factors. It is because Brucci in 2011 said, a better political governance tends to reduce child undernutrition and that democracy helps to prevent famines. Also, democracies are associated with a lower burden of chronic and hidden hunger. In terms of environmental factors, higher levels of rainfall and more land in temperate zones are associated with a lower burden of chronic and hidden hunger. And the third is the role of food availability and food access. As we know, a higher total food supply is associated with a lower burden of chronic and hidden hunger, even after controlling for. While this is expected, it clearly underlines that increases in food supply quantities continue to play an important role in the fight against the different forms of hunger. And the last is the role of health and gender. Why? 
because food utilization and health are both determined by resources of the caregiver, especially levels of education and women's status. The female school enrollment and the female to male life expectancy ratio are both associated with a significantly lower burden of chronic and hidden hunger. Education, especially for women, and improving public health and sanitation also have considerable potential to reduce the burden of hunger. Next, please. Then, what about the food and nutrition profile in Indonesia? Next. Here is what are we facing right now. Anemia on pregnant women are increased from 37.1% and become 48.9%. And also obese and overweight tend to increase from 2007 to 2018. Undernutrition and stunting to, uh, tends to decrease, but still in high number. The data on 2019 show that stunting prevalence is 27.7%. Uh, and from this data, we can see that we are facing triple burden of malnutrition. Next. Here is the data of anemia among women of reproductive age uh, from FAO data. The anemia on this group also tends to increase. Next. And here is the data from risk case does, uh, such as Indonesian basic health survey. On the left side, you can see the proportion of pregnant women who get iron tablet from 2007 to 2018, the data tends to decrease uh, from 92.2% to 73.2%. And on the right side, uh, show the data of the risk of chronic energy deficiency. Uh, and we know it with KEK. K, cake uh, in pregnant women, it show uh, decreasing from 24.2% to 17.3%. Uh, Next. And now we are going to talk about dietary uh, diversity. Dietary diversity reflects nutrient adequacy she, uh, since no one food can meet 100% nutritional requirement for a person. It is also related to the consumption of food groups from at least one animal source and one fruit or vegetable source besides staple food. And of course, it is affected by uh, food security. Next. And what is food security? Uh, food security is a situation in which all people at all times have physical, social, and economic access to sufficient, safe, and nutritious food which meets their dietary needs and food preference for an active and healthy life. Next. Here is the data from FAO. It shows a uh, per capita food supply variability in Indonesia. From the graphic, we can see that since 2000, there is the increasing of per capita food supply, but since 2009 tend to increase. Next. As mentioned previously in the UNICEF conceptual framework, the challenge is not only about food availability, but even with high variation, when the lowest basic factor are not supportive, economic, political, and security can hinder access to food various foods. Fortunately, our political index is stable, as you can see from this graphic. Next. However, compared to international standard, Indonesia's dietary diversity is still lower. Based on Global Food Security Index, we are ranked 102 out of 113 countries in dietary diversity. And next, what are the challenges on ensuring dietary diversity? Next, please. First, poverty or food affordability. Poverty and the cost of food were clear drivers of food choice. World Food Program report on the cost of diet in Indonesia that showed that about 40% 
of people cannot afford to eat a full range of nutritious foods. And the second, uh, food availability, because the foods that most of Indonesian people consume is greatly influenced by local availability, especially fresh foods. And third, convenience. The time involved in food preparation is another consideration. Lack of time to cook at home was a concern for some Indonesian people who would prefer to do so if they had the time. And fourth, health and safe concerns. Health is another factor, particularly for children. People are familiar with the slogan for healthy and five perfect, which refers to foods from the healthy eating uh, pyramid. And fifth uh, is culture and tradition. The reliance on a view foods is also related to habits and local cuisine. For example, the consumption of white rice as the main staple of food is a deeply rooted practice. Cost is also a factor uh, driving this narrow choice, particularly for the staple. Uh, for example, rice. Uh, and we usually say, I feel like I haven't eaten uh, if I don't eat white rice, right? And also, Products made from soybean are also popular, uh, such as tempeh. This habit can result in a narrow range of food being consumed from uh, the main food groups, as revealed by the narrow species diversity in the main food groups. And the last is knowledge of food preparation uh, method. There is a study said that some people do not know how to cook some green leafy vegetables, which may account for their low consumption rates. Also, consumption of white processed rice illustrates several of this factor. It is consumed in preference to, to the more nutritious red rice because of availability, cost, taste, and preference. Next. And here is uh, the brief of challenges on ensuring dietary diversity in Indonesia. First, there is unhealthy processes. Foods are readily available and foods such as fish and fruit are more difficult to find. And the second, uh, there is limited land on which to grow healthy foods and children eat unhealthy food outside uh, the home, including when at school. And also, even at home, they prefer unhealthy foods and might refuse to eat healthily. And also, there is also a per perception that food is unappealing without added monosodium glutamate. And information on healthy eating and the dangers of processed food is not widely available. And there is widespread advertising and promotion, uh, promotion of unhealthy food in the media. And the last, fam uh, family income is often insufficient to buy healthy food. Next. Based on uh, Indonesian Statistic Bureau in 2016, reported that consumption of vegetable and fruit was below the recommended intake and sugar and oil consumption was too high uh, and diets are heavily reliant on rice while non-starchy foods make up only 30% of diet. This low uh, share signal possible deficiencies. Next. In general, there are three approaches to reduce uh, hidden hunger that are food supplementation, fortification, and dietary diversification. What about in Indonesia? Next. Here is the Indonesia Nutritional Problem Solving Strategies. We have two programs that are specific intervention. It is an attempt to prevent nutritional problems that have an immediate impact and sensitive intervention. It is an effort to prevent nutritional problems that have an indirect impact. The specific program from Ministry of Health, of Health are 
First, provision of supplementary food for pregnant women for the poor or chronic energy deficiency group. And then uh, iron tablet supplementation. And we have promotion and breastfeeding and infant and child feeding and management of uh, nutrition problems. And also there is growth and development monitoring and also antenatal and neonatal care care and then there is immunization prevention of forms and diarrhea micronutrient supplementation but to realize those programs a supporting program is needed such as planning and budgeting coordination local government advocacy civil registration or identity number uh, and birth certificate utilization of village funds and incentive system development, socialization and campaign, and the last is uh, annual survey data. Next. Here is the coverage of vitamin A capsule received in the last 12 months in children, 6 until 12 months by province 2018. Our national data show that only 53.5% infant receive vitamin A capsule according to standard, which is one capsule for infant 6 until 11 months old and two capsules for infant 12 until uh, 59 uh, months old. Next. And here is the iron tablet coverage obtained by adolescent girl and pregnant woman 2018. From this picture, we can see that 76.2% adolescents receive iron tablet, but the most of them consume less than 52 tablets and 73.2% of pregnant women receive iron tablet but most of them consume less than 90 tablet next and for the sensitive program there is a food fortification nutrition education early childhood education non cash food assistance from government and others this requires the cooperation of various ministries and institutions. And uh, next. And here is my conclusion or my resume of my presentation. Uh, first, Indonesia is facing triple burden of malnutrition, including hidden hunger. Micronutrient deficiency that prevalent in Indonesia are vitamin A deficiency and iron deficiencies. And stability of politic and economic of Indonesia have impact to hidden hunger status in Indonesia and diet. Diversity is affected by poverty or food affordability, availability, convenience, health and safety concern, culture and tradition, and knowledge of food preparation. And the last, Indonesia has specific and sensitive program to solve malnutrition problems. Thank you. I return it to the moderator, please, uh, Ibu Hana. Thank you so much, Ibu Mia, for such a great presentation. And it's very interesting because right now we have everything on our hands. You know, if you want to order food, you can just uh, use an app. But apparently we are hungry. Apparently we are not uh, have enough nutrition, you know, from what we choose to eat. Very interesting insight. Okay, so before we move on to a uh, question and answer sessions, let me remind you to fill in the link. Uh, and I'm still waiting for the committee to send me the list of questions for our third and fourth speaker. And Ms. Junda, can you come back uh, to the screen so that we can start our Q&A sessions? Hello. Hi, Ibu. <laughs> and let's say hi to those who are watching us on YouTube. I saw there are more than hundreds watching us. Okay, hello. Today. Thank you for We're... watching us. <laughs> <laughs> and very productive Sunday. Love it. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, so uh, the question is for, let's start our Q&A session now. Uh, the question is for Miss uh, Junda first. Uh, it's from mm -hmm. Muhammad Bisri SPD. Dari SPDI, okay, sorry if I pronounce it wrong, uh, P3MD Kemendesa PDTT, how nutritional intake 
for children who are stunted to increase their growth to normal. So the question is about nutrition for the stunted um, children. Nutrition mm -hmm. for the stunted uh, children. Actually, in my opinion, uh, it depends on the case itself. Sometimes uh, stunted children is also malnourished. And we need to carefully check whether uh, he or she is uh, severe malnutrition or not. Because if uh, there is existing malnutrition in the children, we need to pay attention to the refeeding syndrome. Because if uh, we suddenly give them high uh, calorie intake or high calorie food or uh, other things, it may cause the refeeding syndrome, which can harm for the children itself. Uh, so first check the other nutrition status. Is there any malnutrition or not? And if uh, there is no severe malnutrition, we can provide balanced nutrition for the children, uh, especially for those who are below than two years old. Um, for the because we need to step up carefully for the nu nutritional intake. If uh, normally the stunting is caused by the chronic uh, low calorie consumption, so. Uh, we need to step by step increase their nutritional intake and provide balanced nutrition for them. Uh, for the children who are less than two years old, we can provide 35 to 55% of carbohydrate, fat about 35 to 60% of fat, and protein about 15 to 20%. Uh, however, growth hormone uh, can be uh, supplemented if needed, but we need to consult with the pediatrics as well. Uh, it is easier to correct stunting uh, or stunted uh, for children under two years old because when I read some journals, uh, it is hard to improve the stunted if the children is uh, over than two years old. But if those who are lo lower than two years old, then it's, uh, it's going to be easier to improve the standard. Okay, so basically nutrition intake is very important since early age. Yeah, and, that's yeah. correct. Okay, mm, thank you so much, uh, Muhammad Bisri. We hope we, uh, we hope we answer your question. Okay, the second question for Ms. Junda from Oriza Satifa, MH Tamrin University. Hello, good afternoon. Ms. Junaida. Hello, yes. As we know, some of patients who get treatment in hospital, especially for NCDS, patients don't want to eat the food that already provided from the nutritionist. Either the taste from the food isn't tasty or they lost appetite to eat the food. According to you, or what do you think, how to overcome that case? Because we know Nutrition treatment is one of some treatments for patients to get better from their health condition. So what do you think? Uh, in my opinion, personalized nutrition is very important for the patients. Uh, we need to check what do they like or dislike, uh, their taste preference on the texture that they prefer, because sometimes uh, they are unable to eat the solid food, then we need to um, make the texture to be more liquid or blenderized, something like that. And however, we need to fulfill the energy and nutrition requirements for the patient, even though they do not want to eat. Sometimes um, if the gut is still working, we give the enteral formula or blenderized diet for the patient. Yeah, I think it may help to uh, increase their um, caloric intake and also fulfill the other nutrients requirement. And maybe I think that's all. Oh, and also we need to improve the taste of the food as well because uh, our taste bud uh, is changed uh, when we are sick. So the even delicious food sometimes not taste good. Yeah, so I think it's better to improve the the taste of the food from the hospital as well. <laughs> For example, if those who are getting the 
hypertension, we should not limit the salt intake, right? And I think there are some alternative for the salt that have a uh, less sodium. I think we can use that kind of salt uh, to increase the taste of the to increase the taste of the food. And in in the hospital that uh, when I went uh, the training, uh, the head of nutrition uh, department say that uh, we need to provide the food, the good food that uh, that the patient can eat. For example, she still gives the fried food for the patient to increase the appetite of the patient, something like that. But if they cannot tolerate the solid food, I think the blender rice food or enteral formula is one of choice. Okay, uh, and in your opinion, uh, is it true that healthy food, it doesn't have a good taste? You know what they said, and sometimes they said that if it tastes bad, it's good for your health. <laughs> uh, and I think it's very famous in Korean culture, by the way. Uh, they say yeah. that if it tastes bad, it's good for your health. Do you agree with that? Uh, I don't think that's true because we need to combine uh, the food to make it great taste. Yeah, because if we only have uh, like one type of food, it's not delicious at all. For example, if I need to consume spinach only, I don't like that. But if I combine with onions and shallots or garlic it, and also shrimp, it's gonna taste good. Okay, okay, that's that's a really nice insight. Okay, mm -hmm. uh, and the last question, uh, actually, I, I I have explained. I made notes, and you mentioned about sodium that the you know too much intake of sodium is bad for our health. But what do you think about the substitute like Himalayan salt, pink salt, original salt? Does it matter as the you know supplement or substitution? Uh, just last. Just last two days, I made a review about the Himalayan salt. And uh, actually, the, the, the sodium of Himalayan salt and the table salt is not significantly different. And uh, however, uh, there is a study that showed the intensity of the saltiness of the Himalayan salt is more than the table salt. So we can, even though the sodium content is similar, but the, we can only use a sprinkle, just a sprinkle of Himalayan salt instead of the table salt. However, the Himalayan salt have less uh, iodine. So I think it should be, uh, pay, it should be uh, pay attention. We need to pay attention for the iodine content in the Himalayan salt. Uh, if you want to reduce the sodium content, you may use the MSG <laughs> or uh, less sodium salt. Uh, actually, in the market, there are, there are available the low sodium salt. I cannot uh, mention the brand right now, but I think you can use it. Okay. Okay. And yeah. so uh, last question. Last question is that what do you think about the intake of supplements? To, for example, for vitamins, for iron, for prebiotics, is it a good option? You know, because as Bu Mia mentioned, that we cannot be 100% fulfilled in our mm -hmm. nutrition intake. So, you know, some people take those supplements. Is it really a good option? What do you think? Uh, in my opinion, it's better if we consume from the foods. The first is because uh, foods not only, for example, if we uh, eat guava. Guava is rich in vitamin C, but it's not only rich in vitamin C, but it also rich in fiber and other things. That so when we eat the food, it's not only one thing that we eat, consume, but if we only eat supplement, maybe it only uh, eat one thing. Like for example, if we uh, eat vitamin C, five hundred milligram, then we only get vitamin C itself. And uh, but for those who cannot uh, who cannot uh, fulfill the requirements of micronutrients, for example, pregnant women or the 
uh, anemia children or anemia women, uh, it I think supplements gonna help to fulfill the requirements. Yeah, but because of their requirements of micronutrients is very high and it's hard to fulfill from the diet itself. But for, uh, to me, yes, the dietary diversity is the key. Okay, thank you mm -hmm. so much. Thank hey, you for welcome. my pleasure, Ibuana. <laughs> thank you. Okay, so the next question and answer session goes to Ibu Mia. Okay, Ibu Mia, the first question uh, is from the data from uh, as a physiotherapy. How could we know if we have silent hunger? Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you for the question. Uh, Actually, we can diagnose ourselves if we feel that we are weak and tired. Uh, maybe we need to check uh, our hemoglobin. Uh, uh, it may be we are uh, anemia, uh, whether we are anemic or not, we check our hemoglobin. And also uh, we can analyze our food consumption if we have been eating nutritious, uh, varied and balanced uh, diet. Um, it is uh, not possible that we have a uh, hidden hunger, but if our food is not uh, diverse, uh, not too good, uh, maybe uh, we are, uh, we have a uh, hidden hunger such as uh, anemic, like that. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, Ibu Mia. Uh, so is it, anemia is like the most common issue, right? That based yes, on in your Indonesia. research. Yeah, okay, in interesting, Indonesia. wow. Okay, so second question is from Dewi Maria Wijaya SST, MGZ from RSUD, Dr. Saiful Anwar Malang. How to avoid hidden hunger for underprivileged or for the poor? What do you think? Okay, uh, to avoid hidden hunger, uh, we also we uh, we should increasing dietary diversity uh, by providing foods with adequate amounts of micronutrient. Uh, it is one of the most effective ways to sustainable prevent hidden hunger, uh, like I mentioned in my presentation. It is important to fulfill the micronutrients need through nutrient-dense complementary food. And also, we have nutrition uh, balance, nutrition guidance, um, namely tumpang gizi seimbang. You can search on Google. If we applicate those tumpang gizi seimbang, it will avoid us from hidden hunger. Uh, for poor people, we can choose a cheap, uh, food but still nutritious uh, such as um, egg uh, as a protein, uh, protein source and tempeh. Uh, tempeh is also uh, cheap and uh, they can consume seasonal fruits such as right now. Uh, right now we can uh, find a mango with only 1000 per kilo or uh, it is less than one dollar. Uh, I think it is cheap uh, to be consumed. Uh, thank you, Miss Hanna. I think that is my answer. Yeah, uh, thank you so much, Bu. And I also learned that from you today that we have the tumpang gizi seimbang. I feel quite ignorant because all this time I thought that empat sehat lima sempurna is still a thing. So, but apparently we have moved forward. Okay, yes. and uh, one more question for Ibu Mia from uh, Binawan University, but I think his name is Himawan, maybe. Uh, the prevalence of macronutrient deficiency cases and also the micronutrient deficiency is equally high in Indonesia. Do you think our government could address this problem harmoniously? Okay, uh, as I mentioned in my uh, presentation, uh, our government have sensitive and specific program and for the uh, for the sensitive uh, program 
it is needs a cooperation of various uh, parties. Uh, for example, from uh, the Ministry of Education, Ministry of Trade, Ministry of Maritime Affairs, and uh, they all work together to solve nutritional problems in Indonesia, including micronutrient deficiencies or uh, hidden hunger. So I think our government try uh, their best to solve our nutrition problem in Indonesia. I think that is my answer. Thank you, Ms. Hana. Thank you. Uh, and Bumia, last question. Based on your experience as a nutritionist, uh, do, which country do you think has the best nutritional implementation and why? I think Japan is the best uh, country that uh, in uh, they have nutrition uh, profile that they have a good nutrition profile because as uh, the professor Yamauchi mentioned they uh, they walk so much and work is such uh, a physical activity uh, to uh, make our um, body mass in body mass index become uh, good become ideal uh, I think Japan is uh, the best uh, country that have a good um, nutrition profile. Thank you, Ms. Hana. Okay, thank you so much. So thank you for all the speakers uh, for the presentation, for the sharing the information, answering questions, etc., etc. We are approaching the end of our discussion. And before we close it, I would like to announce a happy news for the giveaway winners. Uh, again, thank you, Bumia, and thank you, Ms. Junda. Um, so My yeah. Pleasure, Ibuhana. Thank you. Okay, so the winner of the giveaway, the first one is Nur Aziza, STR uh, Gizi, from Poltekas, Jakarta 2, who lives in Bekasi. Yay, congratulations to uh, Menur Aziza and the second uh, giveaway winner is Oriza Satifa from MH Tamrin University, which based in Depok. Okay, great. Um, so I believe it's time for me uh, to summarize the what the speakers have presented to us. Make sure that you watch your nutrition intake. And I believe that the more, or we believe that the more we know about what we consume, it really affects our health and there's never wrong with educating ourselves because informations are everywhere and even this event is conducted on Sunday and yet we are filled with a very uh, useful informations and knowledge and again we hope that this event is um, is really useful for you and thank you for staying with us uh, since the beginning uh, until the end thank you so much again for the speakers uh, from Japan and from Indonesia and from everywhere. Thank you. Thank you for sharing your knowledge with us. And I think I can safely con conclude this event today. And yeah, uh, I'm going to officially close it again. Thank you. Thank you for everyone watching on YouTube. See you again on our next event. Bye. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good afternoon. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you, Miss Hana. Thank you. Okay. This is a imbang. Wujudkan insan sehat yang mandiri. Pangan dan hidup bersih. Menuju bangsa yang sehat. Hey! Berprestasi. Selamat datang di Universitas Binawan. Universitas Binawan berdiri sejak tahun 2001. Saat ini kami berkembang dengan 13 program studi yang tersebar ke dalam enam fakultas. Pertama, Fakultas Keperawatan dan Kebidanan dengan tiga program studi, yaitu D3 Kebidanan, S1 Keperawatan, dan Profesi Nurse. Yang kedua, kami memiliki Fakultas Kesehatan Masyarakat dengan tiga prodi juga, yaitu D4 Keselamatan dan Kesehatan Kerja, 
kemudian S1 Gizi dan S1 Teknik Lingkungan. Yang ketiga adalah Fakultas Sains dan Teknologi dengan tiga program studi, yaitu D4 Teknologi Laboratorium Medis, S1 Farmasi, dan S1 Aktuaria. Yang keempat, kami memiliki Fakultas Fisioterapi dengan program studi D4 Fisioterapi. Dan kelima, Fakultas Sosial dan Humaniora dengan program studi S1 Kesejahteraan Sosial dan program studi S1 Psikologi. Terakhir, kami memiliki Fakultas Ekonomi dan Bisnis dengan program studi S1 Manajemen. Metode pembelajaran di Universitas Binawan dengan menggunakan metode perkuliahan dalam jaringan dan belajar langsung melalui praktikum serta magang di institusi nasional dan internasional. Nah, dengan metode ini terbukti bahwa sudah banyak alumni Universitas Binawan yang terserap di pasar kerja internasional. So, mengapa harus kuliah di Universitas Binawan? Karena kami tidak hanya mendasari konsep pengetahuan, namun juga memberikan pengalaman langsung untuk menguatkan kompetensi yang diperlukan pasar kerja. Ayo wujudkan mimpi kalian bersama Universitas Binawan, kampus internasional, digital, dan berakhlak. Binawan, kampusku. Kami berdua lulusan dari Universitas Binawan Jakarta Kami berdua lulusan tahun 2018 dan sekarang bekerja di Aero Food Industrial Catering Jadi nggak akan nyesel untuk kuliah di Binawan Jakarta